Hi. Um, thank you, Heads, for having me. Um, this is the first time that I'm going to be presenting an English show. Just be patient. If in a moment I just do a post session or maybe um, some uh, Spanish word comes up. Well, um, right now, this, okay. um, in 2014, I was asked by um, some, of the, some of the leaders on the institution and also the chancellor to design the first doctorate degree that was going to be offered in the institution. And for me, it was a huge responsibility. So at that moment, she asked me specifically to work on um, some doctorate program on the discipline of, or the field of business communications. This began on 2015, a doctorate in education and leadership and instruction um, in business learning. Um, in 2015, when I proposed the curriculum, I wanted to be different. I just don't want it as the typical online learning with the instructional modules and I sort of be a mechanic, you know, course. So I wanted professors to be present and, and also students. So in 2015, it was very important to me, this topic about virtual presence. And I noticed that locally, many um, people here in Puerto Rico, they wasn't like a big interested on the topic. There wasn't a research whatsoever made here um, on the island. They said, well, this is something that I should um, make a research or study. Because at the beginning, the distance learning, one of the biggest problems was the geographical distance between the student and the professor. And at that point, they were studying how they can um, introduce um, strategies to just so they can feel together. They will experience real interaction uh, among the um, online learning environment. So at that moment, I. Um, study or evaluated some activities that promote virtual presence in online um, courses. So I began with a general qualitative research and I proposed a framework that maybe uh, some professors they can apply to promote um, the presence, virtual presence in online learning. And basically it had four stages, dialogue, interaction, and instructional design and leadership. But those actions, right? It was maybe uh, promising that something was going to happen different and that we compare it with the regular online learning course. Um, but that moment, it was not enough. So I just conducted a quantitative research to see if those actions would generate some type of difference in um, student outcomes. So for me, surprisingly, um, the results were very good and beneficial, but at that moment, we had, we have, we still have the Center of Innovation and Education that that center helps uh, professors um, simply uh, change the ways of teaching, not only in online and also face-to-face. Uh, -face. So uh, that would bring me to this topic because we're always interested in social presence and social learning and maybe um, trying to uh, have professors present because since it's online, we don't know if they're you know, engaging that much with students. So I didn't want this to be like a supervision exercise. So um, in that case, you know, I wanted to focus more on the cognitive aspects. And you see this, right? <laughs> Maybe sometimes it happens. So to start, Let's analyze this cartoon, right? And how many still think that learning is a waste of time or invaluable? Luckily, we have millions of research that demonstrate that there, there is no significant difference um, if we compare students' um, achievement face-to-face -face and in online learning. So, um, but that's not my main concern. My main concern is that I do worry that those who have students that still wander around in classes face to face at home or also in online. So let's see this other scenario, right? It works as long as the teacher doesn't follow you, right? So like Stella 
told us this morning about the Zoom issue, right? So I most definitely don't want this to happen to you if you offer or you teach an online course. So what we're going to go to the basic. What is cognitive presence in online learning? So basically, cognitive presence is described by many as a fundamental indicator of a quality of learning experience since it involves an authentic approach based on an active collaboration and construction of knowledge in the online environment. So this is a core um, um, element of the community of inquiry that is the basic framework that I'm going to be talking about, um, that it was proposed by Garrison and other researchers in 2001. And this was to guide online learning environments and support supporting social approaches to learning. And at that moment, they defined the cognitive present as the extent to which learners are able to construct and confirm meaning through sustained reflection and discourse in a critical community of inquiry. Here we're talking about not only the experience of one student, you know, many, and also it interprets the professor um, during this whole process. So this is the community of inquiry model. And in simple term, this model was designed to serve us as um, a metric, right? Or maybe a, a framework and to capture the educational dynamic and guide the study of the online learning effectiveness and specifically higher education. Because in the 90s, research was mainly focusing on the role of the instructor, also the social aspect of learning and the futures of the technology, because at that moment it was the transitioning from the correspondence um, study to the media, internet, and all these technology advancements that we uh, have seen right during these um, past years. So presence is a sense of being, and this can be possible through the development of three interdependent elements social, cognitive, and teaching presence. And the teaching presence is basically mainly um, focusing on the professor. So now let's take a look at the cognitive present practical model. And this is a framework that I use for this qualitative research. And this uh, practical model applies, uh, applies some of Dewey's initial thoughts about reflective inquiry. And this PI model has four phases. As you see, it starts with the triggering, triggering event, then the exploration, then triggeration and resolution. And I think this is a way to um, um, change the way we apply the famous discussion forums in the online course, right? That sometimes they point a little, they become a little bit mechanical because we use them so much that the students, they already know and they just do it in a mechanical way. Sometimes when I used to do this at, at the beginning, because really I've typed everything, you know, I've been an online professor for many years. And at the beginning I said, you know, how, why are they writing about this? Why they always have to say, you know, I agree with what you're saying. Why they cannot um, disagree. Why cannot they give a different opinion, a different perspective, is that sometimes um, the way that we present the activity doesn't give space for students to do that reflection phase and also the, the iteration or exploration process. So I'm going to be um, talking a little bit more about the stages um, when I uh, show you the practical phase of this um, process. Well, the methodology that I applied was a descriptive, um, was an exploratory case study of the intrinsic there. I want to clarify. And I wanted to examine the results of the cognitive present practices in a specific course that I'm going to be describing. And the main research question was um, how did the stages of this practical model of cognitive presence were manifested to build meaningful online experiences in a critical community of thinking? And I was saying at the beginning, when I designed the curriculum of this um, doctoral program, it was um, maybe mostly mandatory that professors had these virtual meetings with students. You know, but later on, we changed that. 
because we didn't want to force them to develop the activities. But um, it surprised us that sometimes when um, we tell students that we're going to have certain amounts of virtual meetings through the semester, they want more. And it's because we don't conduct these Zoom meetings, right? These famous Zoom meetings that are uh as the typical way maybe others choose to do so i think i can elaborate a little bit more for dawn so yeah, this is a doctoral degree and this is a third side master of uh, course and the topic is instructional design for virtual environment and it is expected that um doctor students come with high level um cognitive skills but that is not always the case in our case, I have um, physical therapists, um, speech from, I have psychology, I study their majors in psychology, I have um, a preach, I have um, someone from the CIA, I have um, from education, I have leaders, so you name it, I have it, in that. and sometimes in the interviews, he's, he's helping me um, do the interviews of the students for the admission, and when I have these kids, I'm like, how are they going to use this doctorate degree for what? And it's very surprising the answer that they give us to what are their future goals and what their main purpose is like to uh, be in and get into the program. So for me, it's very challenging because I have to go from the basics and then try to take them to the higher level, level of cognitive skills. So. I use a variety of technology since um, I try to motivate the, the synchrony and synchrony aspect of the course. And I'm going to be explaining how I take it from the online. So this is a little bit of the demographical information related to the um, to the course. I had two sections. So I'm the I'm the academic director of the doctoral program of the doctoral school. In the university, and uh, this course had two sections at the beginning. Um, people were so much interested in this doctoral degree that we had a first group uh, of a board that it was like I think we had more than 60 students, and all the groups are more than 20 and 30 in one section. So I know that's crazy, you know, in a doctorate level. And uh, maybe if they tell you to teach one of those courses, you're gonna go, you know, gonna run away. But um, for us, it's very normal. Um, but in this case, we divided the section, and, and this group was a group of 14 students. It's the first time that I have students that um, live in Puerto Rico. I have students from Benfica, Japan, um, or well, you name it. I have we have maybe more than the 50% of the students that live in Puerto Rico. So that that is more challenging because of the time. Now some. So I have some students that over there is like eight in the morning and over there is over here is at night. So it's a very challenging game to um, agree in a time where we can meet um, and can you know develop the synchrony aspect of the online course. Okay, so for the first um, stage, this is the triggering event. Um, this cycle initiates with an issue, a dilemma, or a problem long or, or the, the course context. So this typically is presented by the professor and the instructor um, during this process triggers by the event and is to guarantee um, the student's engagement with the issue or with the problem. So at the beginning, I um, developed a video chat. I use Flipgrid for this. It's a very good tool that makes me um, maybe uh, uh, develop, also apply a sort of a discussion portal, but in a different way. And um, I always uh, tell the students, no, I don't want you to write. This, this is going to be a video show. So you're going to record yourself, and we're going to have this type of, of, of synchronous um, dialogue. So as you see, um, they invested more of the time that they supposed to on this activity. And the topic was what size fits or doesn't work. You know, they see this topic and like, what do you mean it doesn't work? It always works, no? Um, and I, uh, I put an article so they can analyze why from the perspective of instructional design, it doesn't work. And, and that was that triggering event. So um, at that moment, 
um, I had only 14 students, but as you see, I had uh, 1,515 uh, views, they comment also, and the other uh, arguments of the students, and they have 17, almost 18 hours of discussion. So that's a more the amount of time that we usually recommend um, typically for a week um, to, to there to spend in the online learning. So that was the first um, activity. And then in the on the exploration stage, this is still the stage when we want students and the main goal is to comprehend the nature of the issue before looking for uh, relevant data and potential solutions. So I uh, just gave them that introduction of the problem. I also um, offered a video conference call, uh, talked about the problem. And one of the statements that I used to do is that um, most of the uh, universities or maybe uh, organizations that offer some types of some type of online courses, they don't design their courses or certifications with a formal instructional model. They depend on maybe mental schemes or what they think is better for their students or whatever fits for the faculty needs, you know? Um, so I told them, well, I think that's the problem. So we have to discover it, Dr. Red or not. But most of the research stated that um, most um, instructional designers, they have problems when they um, design the online courses because they don't depend on an instructional um, model. So that was, you know, the triggering event and what I was trying to um, lead them to investigate. So uh, it is expected in this phase that students move to a brainstorming phase. And um, during this activity, gather information. So what I did was, besides of um, uh, developing this regular reader conference, I had a guest expert. And I rang experts from other universities that they have a role in the instructional design process. And we interviewed them and we asked you know, what are the policies? Do you have policies? Do you follow them? Do you have a instructional design model? What is, is that important for you? Um, what problems do you face or challenges, challenges do you face in this process because you don't have, because of the lack of the instructional model? So it's, it was very surprising and relevant the information that they provide us. So I emulated the exercise that I wanted them to do. And in this other, phase of integration. And what did I do? Um, they were supposed to make an essay, but to, in order to write the essay, they had to identify an institution or an organization. And they had to do the same exercise they did during the video conference with these guests. And um, I provide them some um, questions, guideline questions that they were going to do in the interview and I wrote the questions applying an instructional model. And I used typical Addy. That is most of the instructional designers they use it and apply it because it's very simple and everybody um, knows it. So it's the analyze phase, the design, the development, the evaluation. And okay, what questions you're gonna make to analyze the situation and how um, and since the beginning, I was applying the topic, and I just wanted them to see how I applied the topic with these different activities. And you don't have to wait to develop a course to apply an instructional model. So it's, it's, it's only a systematic way to design content. So they went to that um, um, entity, that institution, and they made the, the um, this uh, interview with that person, I told them, I don't need to know the institution. I don't need to know the name of the person. I just want the data. I just want you to be able to confirm if this is a real issue and how you can contribute you to uh, provide solutions to this issue that may be simple. And when they revealed um, the information, it was very surprising. At this phase of resolution, what I did was, I created groups. 
So they did the first phase um, individually because I just wanted to know what they were able to do as an individual. But then I created groups. And when I created those groups, I told them, yes, you have several cases, but you have to analyze them. And you have to determine which case needs the most help. And of course, if they had a leader, they have to support the leader and they have to have made the decision making process and just to decide which case was um, better, you know, to spend the time and, and making a, a proposal. So, in this, in the resolution phase, um, this is the time where they um, spend most of the time. Um, they have more difficulty because this knowledge, they're now applying it, you know, and now it's not just just telling me the data. When you're making a research, you can't have all these numbers, what I'm going to do with the numbers? It's not the numbers, it's not, uh, it's how you interpret the information. So that was the challenging part. So at this point, I asked students to um, apply uh, uh, the get the information, analyze it, and present it, and also bring a resolution to that institution to uh, a better understanding of the problem and also um, provide recommendations to how they can solve the problem. And this information, they had to give it to that institution so they can have it because I'm, I'm working on developing a future expert in, a, in the field. So this is going to be very valuable um, institution higher um, companies to do this for them. So it was it was going to be free. You know, I sort of was going to do that for them. So at this uh, phase, they had to discuss um, the finding, present conclusions, and also recommendations. And um, since it was a group activity, the evaluation was the group. And that, well, I, there are some aspects that I um, evaluate as a group because of the you know, pedagogical interaction, you know, aspect of it. But um, they know that I'm gonna be evaluating case by case. And what I just did was they did the video that you see there, the video presentation, but I use Pathlet so they can just use the board and, and share the information and they don't just reserve it for them and for me. And I'm like, no, I'm gonna share this information because your other colleagues need to know about what is happening on other scenarios and what you recommend. I said that was the, the most important part. So now if you see here, um, this is a practical model, but this is the time frame that I spent to apply it during the semester. This is a course that is offered in a semester. So we have regularly like 14 weeks. And I began uh, the week four with that video, the video chat to just begin with the, the week two, excuse me, to trigger the event. And we spent these two weeks talking about the topic. And also we had a group before the prior those two weeks. And then on the week four, we did um, the lecture. We did like three um, uh, virtual meetings where we had the guest expert and I tried to bring um, different uh, experts from private and also public institutions so they can know this existence and also from a company. And since I was do doing this, I, I um, had this res responsibility in this institution for over eight years. When I began um, working on the distant um, learning associationship, um, we didn't have any formal um, like manuals, blueprints, we didn't have and at that moment, how instructors works that they just translated what worked for them in the face to face course, just put it on the online course. And I saw it, like, not the correct way to do this. So I began applying a model. And at that moment, I proposed an instructional model also. So it can help guide professors through this process. But I had a little had a lot of assistance. Instructors because they thought that I was evaluating them, and that was not the point. And I used to tell them, Look, this is a content that other professors are going to teach. You got to think about not the way that you teach or how you prepare to teach. 
of the way that you can expect students to get the outcome that the, um, achieve the, the objectives and the goals of the course. So um, I shared my experience with them in all those years. I had to create manuals to help with the uh, institutional um, politics, norms, and procedures. And, and I had to also help with the professional um, certification of the faculty to, you know, bring some a little bit of knowledge about the information because what they were doing, it wasn't like um, not well. In in their mind, it was good. It, it wasn't that good or it wasn't that right. But they didn't. Um, they they weren't wrong at that moment because they didn't know how to do it. When I came to the picture, I helped them. And now we have over 700 online courses among the institutions, we are the institution that we have more online programs. So we began this on 1990. Um, and also we began with correspondence studies. So, so we go way back. I wasn't here. I was at that board at this institution, but um, we have a little bit of experience with um, online learning. So as you see, um, this was a full semester activity almost that it was connected. One activity would take you to the other one and to the other one. And when students see that um, the activity is relevant and they also can use the information for the other assignment, they feel more motivated, motivated because they sometimes they have a sense of that they're wasting time with the activity and this, and that, at that moment it doesn't make sense. So I didn't want them. I wanted them to feel motivated in the process and they they made a little bit more sense out of it. So so they began the second week. Then um, in the week four they participated on the uh, video conference. Then on week six they also um, work on the interviews and on week 10, they present in the exposition or the video presentation with the, um, the, the results of the interview that they did. And also they wrote an excerpt and mostly a, a research paper right, with the results. And then they applied the project and they made a, a constant paper too because they this had an extension of activity that I didn't include here because it wasn't enough to provide recommendations to the institution, but they also emulated how they can do it in a constant paper. You know, they presented a case, if it was an anatomy course, if it was a math course, an example of how they can do it, you know, based on the recommendations that they did on this exposition. So basically you see that is something that is, that it was well thought. It wasn't a one week uh, discussion forum. So that's how you generate a very meaningful cognitive person. It's not a matter of one only uh, only one activity activity during the class. So um, these are the technologies that I, that I applied. I use Flipgrid. So the, the LMS that we work on this institution is Blackboard Learn, and it integrates Collaborate as a video conference tool. And students also had to. Um, basically learn to use technology to um, conduct the interviews and also the video presentation. So they use Novio Canva because Canva lets them work on a video presentation and group learn because you can share the presentation with others and they can work on it as well. And also Blackboard learn to create the groups. And um, that was the hard part because sometimes faculty, they're just not willing to spend the time, you know, with all these details, and I don't, I don't, um, uh, I don't judge them because you know that all of us that are professors, there are sometimes that there is a necessity, and they just give you the syllabus. I have this course, I need you to offer it, and I was like, what? Two days prior to the beginning of classes, and you know, all of us have been there and done that. And well, the planning phase is during the process. I know that happens, but this is something that we have to have. Uh, a well thought of all the activities so it could be completed and the results that um, I achieved during this process. So um, this qualitative analysis and it, um, the, this theoretical uh, application of this framework 
throughout the process, I was able to determine the fulfillment of the purpose of the study. And one of the key findings was that students who approach, um, that students during this process approach learning deeply, um, produce learning outcomes that are substantially improved, um, mean, and of a higher quality. And that's what we expect from Dr. Um, Stewart. And that the outstanding strategy plan of the instructional activity needs to motivate this cognitive presence during the course. And also that we don't, we cannot think about cognitive presence if we don't integrate the other two stages, the presence of the instructor and also the presence of the social presence. Because as you saw, at one point I integrated other students and I always was accompanying them during the process and serving as uh, a professor what I am, right? And I didn't leave them alone because all my learning, I know is independent and autonomy, but you need to be present in the online course, course so it can have meaning for the students. At the beginning of the COVID, or at not the end of the COVID, but during the COVID process, I was very upset with what I heard of people were talking, talking about homeschooling and business. We got to do this again. We have millions of research and all of it. They state that there's no significant difference between one and another. Why do we have to argue about this again? But of course, well, we have institutions that even though they spend a lot of time on education and they had all the tools and that, but it's a process that we cannot do from one day to another. So the technology tools were have to use them wisely and effectively to combine the asynchrony and the synchrony of the interaction process. And also you have to motivate the interaction between students with the professor, with the professor and also with the content. So teaching presence was crucial as the, to bring together that social and cognitive aspect of learning, most of all, to fulfill learners' needs and capabilities. Um, I like when students are, are, doesn't know what to expect when they go to the first. Okay, just one more. What Dr. Um, has taught us is, um, I like it when students are motivated and they, they feel joy when they see you and they know that you are the educator. Instead of, I don't want to participate because they just, see it as a negative experience. So there are ways that um, we can make online learning fun, you know, and an adventure too. Recommendations. There is a need to conduct user research to explore the relationship between the three phases, social, teaching, and cognitive. And uh, when the COVID passed, there was a high, there was a bunch of researchers that were very interested on the topic. So the the um the, the, we had more information about the topic, but locally it's still you know a little bit vague and it still is so this is a, a little bit of research there. And the results can lead to provide creative frameworks to facilitate learners content and instructors meaning of interaction. So in the video conference, when the student participate, I don't want them to just turn the computer and just go and come up with it. There are ways that we can uh, promote the engagement of the students. Also, that cognitive presence cannot be applied based on schemas or mental models. The use of a practical model will always favor the effectiveness of designing these actions to generate this type of presence. And also requires a rigorous and helpful instructional review. We have to plan. I go sometimes to schools to evaluate teachers, and it we need to work a lot with some schools. And and when I go to the classroom and I just sit down and see the of uh, the class at the end of the process, I tell them, okay, I just want to see your social comment. I didn't have time to work on it. So we're gonna talk about because some of the flaws that you see during the process. 
I don't want to say it in a negative way, but it's sometimes the last thing that instructors wrote. And in online courses, since everything is written there, everything is published. Students, students expect to the first day see everything. We start the classes on January 20th. And they were already writing. It wasn't even 12. No, I didn't have, even at lunch, they were like writing. I don't see the content of the school. But the person, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm putting the date on my updating it and you're going to have this too. But they expect that you know, it's eight in the morning, eight in the morning, and I go to the first and I see everything there. And um, it's, it's most evident that when you go there and we, we see all these you know, um, bad badges you know, in, the, in the course, is of the lack of, is a consequence of the lack of time during the process. And I had a particular situation last semester that was stopped to me, and he told me, look, I'm, I'm a little bit worried because um, when I go to the court, now I see the syllabus and I see that the professor just, you know, he, he just erased with a pen what is not going to, because we have Fiona last year, we put her in for Fiona, and we suggest professors to look at the activities and the criteria and make the adjustments, you know, so the students students were able to complete everything on time. So we put the syllabus right there. And for them, that was the lack of organization. See, we don't know how the students are going to um, perceive the information. So maybe he did it, he, he, do, he did it at that moment um, without thinking that was going to be uh, maybe disrespectful to students, but they perceive it that way at the moment. And he just wanted them to help him finish his work. So he's scanning and he's breaking the books. And for them, you know, that was the end of the world. Even that it is problematic. So um, uh, also that within the whole practical process of knowledge of presence, uh, presence, the social presence also must be motivated. After all, um, students do not study online only to socialize, but social aspects. Don't get me wrong, I like that too. But um, we don't have the students there only to get each other, you know, to get to know each other. We expect them to learn things, to learn some competencies, so they can um, do well in the professional field. So that was basically the point. How do you have any questions? Please let me know. Mm -hmm. So, um, I really like that you mentioned that, you know, getting a syllabus and then two days later is tough to start teaching uh, without having this whole planning process beforehand. So, what recommendations do you have for instructors in those situations, uh, given that you're teaching instructors how to be like experts in the education process? Well, um, you don't have to apply this right away because at the beginning, students are mostly exploring the topic. So, just give them time. And give you have to have time to see in what stages or levels are are they in. Because with most groups you can do that, but with other groups you know they're a little bit limited um, of the activities that you can achieve during the semester. So um, during this process, just um, integrate these exploration activities that won't affect. You know, it, it, you're not gonna. It's not gonna take. Most of your time, you know, just designing it and putting it right away, and just to let them get the exploration um, phase. But when you put a discussion and activity on your course, it, it has to be it, it has to be related to the topic. And sometimes students say, you know, they just decide not to complete the discussion for them because when they see the criteria, they see that it's only like the five percent. Of the final grade, they say, Why am I going to participate in that? Why am I going to focus my effort and, and participate in another discussion for them? Why? No, nobody's going to read it, or maybe nobody's going to give me a potential um, reply. So I'm going to focus on the, the project that, you know, that is the, the grade of the, of the course. 
So um, during the first week, um, you can just put maybe uh, a news that is related to the topic of the course and just, just let me know what you think about it. Just don't, don't make the activity so formal. No, I just let them know and while they're talking, there's never a, a wrong or an incorrect answer. Just trying to, to lead you to the correct answer. So, so everything is dynamic. So I just want you to talk to me. I just want you to talk to me. I just want you to, you know, feel this intrigue about the topic. And then when you see um what they talk about, then you know how you're gonna plan the activity. And this activity you can do it maybe um in four weeks. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be in the semester. No, you can have that space to plan, even though the syllabus was hand was hand on, you know, two days prior. In our case, the courses they already have content and you already you already have something to work on. Um, so usually professors when we do the the, the programming of the course and the workloads, they have like the course already on Blackboard um since a month prior to the announcements. Most of my professors they already had it on November, of course it was on January. And if they don't see the access maybe on December, they're like, hey, you're late, you know, I don't have my <laughs> I don't have my course on the system because they are already are accustomed that I have to be on time. So that is very important. So the leadership is of the process so that they can have on time the information and they can complete the strategic plan of the academic activity. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have one question. Of the four different aspects of the show, you get a model. Do you think that there was uh, any one that was more challenging than others? Yes, I would say, um, I think the easiest part was the gathering the information. Mostly it was because I gave them the, the guidelines of the questions and they already had what they were supposed to do. And I tried to facilitate that for them so it could uh, laziest part, but when they had to integrate, so when they had to analyze the information and see, okay, now, now I have this information of what they do, and I know what they're not supposed to do. Okay, how I am going to decide which instructional model from the many that are available, which one is the best for this institution, and how and what ways I'm going to tell them, look. This is not the correct way to do it. So I suggest you to look at this model and you know applying this procedure. So that that um that third stage of integration I think was the most challenging part. Um and also bringing them a resolution because it was very interesting that it had many cases where they noticed that the institution didn't know what they were doing whatsoever. But they had other cases that they had everything. It was almost perfect. I'm like, okay, what are you going to do? When you have an institution that it follows the instructions and has everything so nice, so that's more challenging. How to make this institution that is effective that be better than what they are? You know, and I think that was the most um, challenging part. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 